Hello there, I'm Steve from Mac84 and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be talking about VCF East 2022. This was an event put on by the Vintage Computer Festival in April 2022, located in Wald, New Jersey. I was there with Mike of Mike's Mac Shack and Sean of Action Retro, who had an excellent table set up with a lot of vintage Apple goodies. In this video, you'll see what I saw during the show, the tables, the exhibits, the people I met, and all that fun stuff. So let's get started. On Friday, I arrived at VCF to start unloading my things to set up our booth. I was there along with Mike of Mike's Mac Shack and Sean of Action Retro. We brought quite an array of different machines with us, so it was fun to set that up. And already, everybody from the event was walking around seeing what there was. It seemed like the show had already started, even though it wasn't set to start for another day. There were a lot of awesome people that I met at this event, including Colin Mister of Das Dude One fame. He brought along some excellent devices here, including this lovely little Sony Vio miniature PC, which of course was hacked to run Mac OS X, because why wouldn't you? But that's not the only cool thing he brought. He brought a mod book. Now you may have seen these on Sazzy Labs or the Computer Clans channel, but essentially it's a MacBook logic board in a modified case with a special screen. And that screen has a Wacom digitizer overlaid on it, which allows you to draw directly on the screen. As a person who likes to draw, I love this thing. The results are pretty awesome. And I even drew a little caricature here of Colin, which he seemed happy to have. That's part of the fun of these events. You just never know what you're gonna find. Like this mystery Capro that End Commander and Sean of Action Retro were playing around on, just trying to get it to do, well, something. And if you've seen some of Action Retro's more recent videos, you sort of know the result of that. It was a real treat to be able to look at these exhibits as people were still setting things up and tinkering around. The show wasn't officially open yet, but boy was there a buzz in the air. These were actually a bunch of Macs, and yes, that one in the middle does not look like a Mac, but it's actually a Quadra 650 in a special case designed for a medical imaging machine, and it actually has a magneto optical drive instead of the floppy drive. That's what you see there on the right, and it was hooked up to this gorgeous Dell display, and then we have a Macintosh Plus on the left, which was lovingly painted, along with a matching keyboard and a mouse, and this was just a lot of fun to see. These people were very creative, and it was awesome to see this cool stuff on display. There was quite a few Mac stuff at the show this year. This table had quite a few Macintosh clones and earlier Macs, and this table had an Apple II set up with a Mac and an original ImageWriter printer. Speaking of Macs, check out this Xerox Alto computer. Xerox was responsible for a lot of the user interface things that we take for granted today, and this machine is kind of like the grandfather of the Macintosh and a lot of other machines. You have a wonderful display here, a keyboard, a mouse, but that's not the computer. <laughs> this is what does all the thinking. My goodness, is that cool. One of the perks of being a vendor was early access to the consignment and sales area. You have some IBM towers on the left. These are PC compatibles probably. And then there's a Mac Plus in the middle and a Mac Classic on the right. There's a bunch of cool stuff in the middle here. I think that's an Octane 2 at the far end. And there's a all-in-one Mac and an Apple IIgs monitor on the top left. We have some other Apple II systems here. I believe that's a Coco in the middle. And there's a cool Atari system on the top right, which I wish I would have noticed at the show. This display on the left was very tempting, but at $40, I decided to keep my cash for other things. And of course, you have this Apple display on the right, which I believe sold not too long after. This table was really cool. They had a bunch of everything, some power supplies, hard drives, memory. I ended up buying some cables and a SCSI card here. This is a awesome PowerPC IBM system that N Commander picked up. I believe he's working on a video about that. And there was this Apple Cinema display, which was not the best price at $200, but to each their own, and a very yellowed iMac DV behind it. Then there was this Compact Presario, which I had a similar model of growing up. And there's this beautiful little Tandy 1000, which looked to be in excellent shape. Next was this cool thing. This was an Avid PCI extender for only $25 and it was filled with video cards and all sorts of cool stuff. And I was tempted, but I didn't know what I was gonna do with it. But thankfully somebody who will give it a good home did pick it up, so I'm happy for that. There was also some 72 pin memory here, which was great, so I picked up a few of those modules. And then they had this table full of zip drives. Some of these were tested, some of them were not tested, some were SCSI, some were parallel. So the SCSI one's untested, kind of a gamble because these zip drives are not the most reliable thing, but hey, not too bad, I guess. Okay, so it's Saturday, the first full day of the event, and we're about to check out the consignment area to see if anything cool has been added since last we looked at it. So let's take a look. 
It was already crowded by the time I got in here, and there's Retro Tech Chris there on the left being awesome. He just donated a bunch of stuff to the free pile there, and I grabbed a iMac rainbow power cable from him. There's a boxed iMac DV on the bottom left, which was pretty neat at only $125. They had a few all-in-one beige Macs on the left there as well. There were really cool things everywhere. There was this slightly overpriced custom Apple extended keyboard, which had special switches installed. Somebody actually ended up purchasing this, I think, but maybe at a reduced price later on. There was a Newton here, uh, some type of Kindle. Then there's an original Bondi Blue iMac G3 for only $80, not too bad. Then there was this heavily modified Power Mac G4 Quicksilver sitting here on the corner. Uh, a few Mac Minis there on the left, and these lovely Power Macintosh all-in-one systems on the front. One of those sold quite quickly. And this is the table that had the zip drives on it. I actually picked up that Plex Store CD burner in the middle that was a SCSI model. And at the top, there were these MacBook laptops and PowerBooks. The MacBooks were only priced at about $20 to $30, and those didn't last long at all. Those sold very quickly. And we have this huge cinema display, which I might have purchased. And yeah, a bunch of TRS-80 stuff. We had uh, some iMacs here, a Macintosh Portable, which was $1,000. This did not end up selling. But that doesn't mean that there weren't bargains to be had. Just ask this happy fellow. And look at Sean, he's about to buy this thing. <laughs> there was also this interestingly priced uh, Macintosh tower, which was a totally legit system. <clears throat> but there were a lot of cool things here. Keyboards, computers, monitors, displays, stuff you just don't see often. There was also this PowerBook 520C, which apparently had some upgrades done to it for $150 here. This same individual had quite a lot of Mac stuff, and I missed buying a $10 2011 or so Mac Mini from them. But here they have a PowerBook 165 and a Newton E-Mate system. And this young fool, I mean my good friend Tom, was so interested in that 6300, he thought it was a great deal. <laughs> All kidding aside, we were looking at these PowerBooks and MacBooks. The PowerBooks were actually priced quite higher than the MacBooks, but those MacBooks are still a pretty good deal depending on the type of software and stuff you have to run. They're pretty decent systems. Right below on the rack was a Laser 128EX Apple II clone with some Commodore drives. That was a USB Firewire card in the Duo Connect box, a few Apple IIs over there, and this neat Super Disk drive. Now let's get on to our table. I had here set up a power computing Mac clone plugged into a Pioneer LaserDisc player, which was controlled via a HyperCard stack. We also have an iMac G3 DV, that's a flower power model, and a lovely Sony thermal printer that we were plugging into my Quick Take camera. Mike of Mike's Mac Shack brought his iMac G4, his Apple E-Mate, and this lovely iMac G5 prototype, which has a compact flash and SD card slot in there. And of course we have Sean of Action Retro with his lovely G4 Cube running Minecraft. We have his Mystic PowerPC Color Classic and his stealth upgraded Apple IIGS with that MacFX clear case and a lovely borrowed Apple IIGS monitor from yours truly. These were some other cool Macs the next room over. This was an iMac G3 with that Game Wizard 3DFX Voodoo 2 card built in. It is just running this game like nobody's business. These folks were really kind. They let me borrow the box and the manual so I could scan those in to preserve those. And this poor Macintosh Performa was, well, running Windows. Which, sure, why not? They also had this lovely Super Mac clone. It's always fun to see what people do to these machines because they are so customizable. This one has a built-in zip drive. I've seen some with jazz drives and tape drives. It's just always fun to see how people push these clones to the limit. In fact, they had quite a few Macintosh clones. This is probably the most Macintosh clones I've ever seen turned on and up and running together. They had a little LAN going and they were going to play some games and stuff on that. I just thought it was really neat to see these systems all together. This was a cool early Mac with a hyperdrive badge on it. And then we had this Quadra 650. Yes, that is an actual Quadra 650 logic board in that special case, which I thought was really, really cool. Here's a closer look at that Mac Plus, which had a very nice paint job. It almost looked like marble. It looks better in person, trust me. But it was really neat to see. And of course, they had a matching keyboard and mouse painted to match that little computer. So I think that was really neat. And I did like that it actually had a special surprise when you turned it on. That's right, this little Macintosh was packing a green phosphor CRT display, which I thought looked pretty dang cool on that system. Then we have that Quadra 650 next to it, which we'll take a look at the back in a moment, but first let's admire this paint job. It even goes to the back of the machine, 
and we could see a date of 1994 of when this thing was lovingly painted and modded. Now let's take a look at the back of that Quadra 650. As you'll be able to see, all the ports and slots are there. It's just that the case is different, but I think this is pretty cool nonetheless. And speaking of Macintosh conversion projects, we have this lovely Macintosh SE converted into, well, a desktop. Let's find out more about this machine from its creator, Ian. It's a Macintosh SE 30. So I built this about like 15 years ago out of scrap parts. And it's really neat. <laughs> it's your own conversion project. I love yeah. it. You're doing better to, than I do. It's hard to do it on this like this tablecloth. Like, oh yeah, you need a proper mouse pad for shuffle button. Now I've known about these projects for quite a long time. There are quite a few books that tell you how to do this. However, seeing one up close and personal was really cool. So kudos to Ian for making a lovely machine which has a few tricks up its sleeve, of course. So this is a Magneto optical drive, uh, three and a half inch floppy. Wow. Uh, that's a MDA monitor for PC. Looks lovely though. Macintosh OS does look nice and amber. It does, yeah. <laughs> It was lovely playing around with these machines and talking to their creators to find out why they made the modifications they did and what was the driving force behind them. Here's a back look of that lovely custom SE30. You can see some of the innards hiding out there. But we have much more to look at, so let's continue. There was more than just the Xerox Alto on display. There were a bunch of these other huge Xerox systems. I've never seen a lot of these before, not even in pictures. So it was really nice to see them up front and in person and just take a look at the size of these monitors and these keyboards, and it was just a pleasure to see all of these together. A lot of different form factors, a lot of different design languages, but a lot of fun, really. Now, these metal behemoths are quite different from the machines that we're used to today, but a lot of the stuff that we take for granted was pioneered in the early days by systems like this Xerox. The keyboard, the mouse, a display with easy to understand icons and a user interface that you could actually use a pointing device to interact with instead of typing commands? Nah, that'll never catch on. I really liked looking at these early examples of a user interface. Of course, it's very different than what we're used to today, but you could see some of the similarities here. And that grayscale display had a super high resolution too. And ah, oh, heck, this keyboard is just beautiful too. Look at those vertical lines. And of course, you have to have a matching mouse as well. And then finally, there's this other lovely Xerox system too. It seems like almost every table had its own special dot matrix printed banner, which was just friggin' awesome. Here's another look at the Xerox Alto, which is actually up and running. Take a look at that crisp display. That is just beautiful. But as we mentioned before, the machine is not what's on the table. That's this big boy here, doing all of the heavy lifting. Here we had some Tandy computers on display, again with a lovely dot matrix banner. This was really fun because I've never really experienced Tandy computers, so to see them all up and running here was a real treat. This room was just packed with so many things, I didn't get photos and videos of all of it, but you could just see there are some really cool things on display. But thankfully, I wasn't the only one taking photos and videos, and I will link in the video description to some awesome walkthroughs that other people have done. This was a cool little setup, a tale of two apples. You had an Apple II Plus here, and then to the right, there was a Macintosh setup. And so you had an image writer printer in between them, so I think they were both sharing uh, the access to that printer, and there were banners being printed throughout the day, which was really nice. So I think this was where most of those banners came from, Although I could be wrong, because there were a lot of different dot matrix printers just screeching away throughout the show, so who knows. This was a lovely exhibit all about portables, and of course there was a Macintosh portable here. This is a backlight model, which was on display, and this lovely IBM PS2 with a gas plasma display. There was something for everyone here, and since these were portables, or luggables, whatever you'd like to call them, there were a lot of interesting form factors, and a lot of stuff I've just never seen before. So it was really nice to see all these things up and running. You could just walk up to them, poke around, and play some games, or do some word processing. Alright, let's take a quick trip back to the consignment area. The free pile is on the back left, just if you were curious. One of the Power Mac all-in-ones had sold, but there's now an Apple Cinema Display LCD at the top of that shelf. You'll notice the top of these shelves, though, are all empty. All of those PowerBooks and MacBooks sold pretty quickly. 
A bunch of PCs were added here, but there are still a few Macs here and there. That big old acrylic Apple ADC LCD display is gone because, well, I purchased it. But, um, hey look! New old stock floppy disks! But if floppy disks weren't what you were after, there was still quite a number of things to purchase, even in the middle of the day. In fact, some things were added, like this row of fine PCs that were set up on display here. You could play around with them and decide if they were worth purchasing or not. It was also really cool to see so much sealed software, even though it was for a system I didn't have or I wasn't too interested in. You just don't see that stuff too often, so it was really neat to see. There were still quite a number of zip drives on the table, although Mike of Mike's Mac Shack made a great purchase of all the Firewire peripherals that were hiding on this table. And of course, who doesn't want free filth with their $5 purchase? <laughs> but just because the show was going on, that does not mean that stopped people from bringing in stuff to sell. And this was a gateway tower that just came in. This person was bringing in some compact items and some Sony Vio things. And sometimes they just did not even leave the cart. Somebody bought it before the person could get it on the table. Speaking of parts, there was this Macintosh 2VX, which really needed recapping. It was next to this ImageWriter 1, which was tempting, but I really focused on this. It was as is, needed a recap. The case actually looked better than the one I had, so I was like, you know what? Let's take a look inside. And oh boy, that logic board needs some love. But the machine had the hard drive and the floppy drive, and I knew the owner of this machine, so for $40, that was a done deal. While I was looking around, people were unloading things, and as soon as they were unloaded, people would pick them up and purchase them. So you really had to keep an eye on the consignment area, because a lot of things went very quickly. You really had to keep your eyes open, and if you saw something you liked, you should purchase it before it ended up gone. Back at the booth, we have this excellent exhibit behind the screens. This showcased a lot of the computers and hardware that was responsible for displaying weather systems or TV guide type channels which of course used computers to display this information. A lot of this stuff was proprietary and really difficult to get up and running. It was fascinating talking to these people about the challenges involved. We were lucky enough to be located right next to them, so we got to hear that smooth jazz music throughout the entire event. This was recorded pretty late in the day, but earlier there were tons of people around this Commodore table, so there was a lot of cool stuff on display. So people were just at that table just making a racket with those noisy keyboards, which was, of course, music to our ears. Next to them was this setup showcasing Japanese gaming PCs. There were two machines on hand here, and a plethora of boxes and cool stuff that was very fun to see. Next to them was this speech synthesizer setup, which had the speaker cranked to 11 throughout the entire show. Here's a behind the scenes look of our table. Of course, I have a totally normal fan plugged into the back of that power computing machine to keep it cool. And speaking of keeping cool, yeah, that iMac G3 needed an external fan to cool it off because it got hot. We also had that Quick Take 200 that I used to take photos and print out to guests who walk by our booth. And here's a behind shot of Mike's setup and Sean's setup too. While we were at our booths, we tried to keep busy with different projects. One of those was, installing the Ethernet drivers for Sean's add-on Ethernet board for his Macintosh Color Classic. And so as Sean declared, He needs a little help. So I quickly got to work trying to figure out how to get the Ethernet drivers onto this system. It was a very, very convoluted process, and we weren't quite sure what Ethernet card was installed in there. So, I did what any sane person would do. I rigged up a convoluted network of machines and devices to get data from one Macintosh to the other. But of course, like all things retro computing, we had our ups and downs. So I took a survey from the crowd to see where we stood. All right, place your bets. Will it work? I hope. Will it work? Will it work? If you leave, yes. <laughs> Will it work? Maybe. Will it work? I don't work here. <laughs> Will it work? I can't tell you. Will it work? I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. So would all of that hard work pay off? Let's see. I don't think so. Hey, oh, it did. Hey. It did. Hey. There we go. All right, now pay up all of you who said it didn't work. <laughs> so we finally answered the question, how many nerds does it take to set up an Ethernet card? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> it takes out That's pretty bad. It's about 25. So we downloaded it from my iPhone to the MacBook, and then we copied it to the iMac G5. <laughs> it went from the iMac G5 to the iMac G3, then it copied it to the clone, to the blue SCSI, and then it copied it to here. So, 
Success. Which is actually the official way of doing it if you read the manual. That's Apple's official uh, official manual way. To Don't do listen to this man. <laughs> And now that this Mac Color Classic had access to the internet, or at least a local network, we're able to load up a very rudimentary web page. Yay! We did it. Click on default. Default. Load that HTML. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm in mission control. We got it. Wow. We did it! What do you have to say about your, your shenanigans here, sir? Oh, that's awesome. And of course, with all that time to ourselves, some of us got a bit loopy. What is all this racket, sir? Let's play video games. Or two holding together. It's because there's like a little angry hornet back there. And I go like, just very carefully, like, I know. Just like, I got it, I got it, I got it. Dude, but I want to do it. <laughs> oh well, it may have been those capacitor fumes. Those things are crazy. There was also this awesome table that Amiga of Rochester was hanging around at with a bunch of friends, which showcased a lot of development machines for video game consoles. You had some Microsoft stuff, some Sony stuff, a Dreamcast system back there, some Nintendo things here. Again, you could see photos of some of this stuff online, but seeing it in person gives you a whole new appreciation for this type of stuff. Next, we have some particularly dirty Macintoshes. Now, this might be a bit squeamish for some of you, so look away if you have weak constitutions. But these folks found a Macintosh SE outside and thought to themselves, well, what if we buried it for six months? Would it still work after that? And, well, they took it out of the bag and brought it outside. And, oh, goodness, did this look terrible. But, really, not too terrible? The logic board didn't actually look too bad, and yes, they were merciful and removed the ROM chips and the floppy controller chip. But we'll check back a bit later to see if they had any progress on this. Here is a lovely view again of the behind the screens exhibit. This was a bit after hours here, but it's just lovely to see these machines. Unfortunately, I caught this table after hours as that was the only time I really got away from the booth, but there was a next cube case here, which was pretty neat. Then there was this table with a huge amount of handhelds. It had calculators, one laptop per child machine. You had this libretto, you had an Apple eMate, you had these Palm Pilots, you had some pocket PCs. So much cool stuff was on this table. You have that beige Tandy on the left that's about to come into view, the row of Apple Newton message pads. And not only was it fun to see the stuff all in one place, but it was fun to visually compare them and see the sizes in person because sometimes you see photos online and you're not really sure, oh, is that Newton message pad about the same size as a Palm Pilot? And No, okay, that's actually bigger. So it was really fun seeing these on display, especially that prototype Newton 110 with the clear case. Here we have Mike tinkering with some PC for some reason. I think he was actually removing the battery from this thing. But <laughs> yeah, we had some spare time in between people visiting the booth. And what better way to eat up your free time than to painstakingly scan every side of a box and every page of a manual. That's just what I did here. The Game Wizard Voodoo 2 card is something of a personal grail item for me, and I do have that card, but I did not have the box or the manual, so these kind folks lent it to me so I could archive it. Finally, it was Sunday, the last day of the show, but that doesn't mean there weren't things to see and bargains to be had. One of the first things I did was make my way to the consignment area to see if anything had been added overnight or anything new was on display to take a look at. First off, we see this Apple IIe, which was a new addition here. Next to that Apple Cinema display, some other stuff here, and of course that iMac, which has seen better days. Especially that keyboard. Ugh. I was actually surprised to see that Apple Image Writer was still there, but thankfully somebody else bought it before I got the idea in my head to buy one. As you can see, there was still quite a lot of stuff on display. Although the majority of the items here were left over from the previous day, there was still a steady flow of people bringing stuff in to sell. I was actually tempted to get one of these network switches, which you'll see in a second, but I was too busy being distracted of rummaging through bins of cables and adapters and things, so I decided to pass on it. I have to give kudos to the awesome people running the consignment area this year. They were using a completely new system and a completely new setup, 
and it went very well. So great job guys, you knocked it out of the park. I saw this lovely iMac that was boxed. I don't know if this was just on the floor before, but look at this thing. This is in pretty darn good shape. Considering this person was also selling an iMac DV for $125, their asking price of $400 for this system was a bit much. As you can see, they did mark that down to $200 later on, but it did have the box, it did have the keyboard and the mouse, it was missing some of the documentation and other things, but really not too bad in condition. It's not every day you see one of these iMacs in the original box. But it also had a trick up its sleeve, a SCSI adapter. That's right, a mezzanine SCSI adapter, which also has video capture functionality. And so after finding the seller, which was no easy task, had to track them down, literally. And uh, yeah, we made a deal on this and I brought it home. And I don't know if this will keep in my collection permanently because I already have one of these machines, but I definitely wanted that card that was inside. Hour after hour, many people came by to check out the machines that we had on display. Whether they wanted to play some games or just poke around with the operating system, or you had parents showing their kids machines that they used when they were younger. It was really fun to see people just come up and love these machines and interact with them. People loved playing around with the Laserdisc player and controlling it via this HyperCard stack. And a lot of people were playing a lot of the demos and games that were set up on my iMac G3, Mike's iMac G4, and Mike's iMac G5. It was also a lot of fun to have people get their photo taken with my Quick Take camera. Keen eye viewers will notice that Havmaster himself, Javier, left a candle on top of my Sony printer which would find its way home with Sean and would hopefully help him with his K-Pro experiments. It was such an amazing experience to be the hosts of these machines and talk about them. So when people came up and asked about them or they brought their kids there and they were asking about machines and how they worked or what the button did or what software was running on it or how did you find this? You know, we were just entertaining these individuals and answering all their questions and having a great time. I met so many people I can't even remember half of the names there. But even people who couldn't make it found a way to have their paraphernalia just lying around on tables to let them know that 8 bits are all you need. And yes, for those of you who are concerned, to steal a phrase from Sean, my totally normal computing fans actually survived and the power computing machine and the iMac G3 ran flawlessly throughout the entire show. None of them overheated, which is quite a big feat because the iMac G3s get pretty toasty. Although I think I'll have to figure out a more elegant solution for mounting a fan next time. Sean's Mystery K Pro got a lot of attention, with a lot of smart people poking around on it and inspecting what was inside of the machine. Now I won't spoil anything here, but check out Action Retro's latest video on his K Pro. There was a lot of excitement here going on with this machine at the show, and I managed to capture a lot of that footage. So check out that video, I'll put a link in the video description. Ah, uh, is there anything better than the noises of a dot matrix printer? No, the, the answer is no. No matter where you walked at this show, there was something really interesting to take a look at. Everything was lit up, turned on, making noise, and just waiting for you to poke a key or use the mouse. And I just love the designs of some of these systems. I mean, just look at this Tandy. Far out. And there were some cool things I just never heard of before, like these awesome televideo systems. I'm starting to reuse my adjectives here, so I'm just going to let the show do its talking. Here's a little ambiance of VCF East 2022.
there was this ingenious setup here where if you dialed a number, this system actually made all of these phones ring. It made a huge racket and it was really funny to see. Unfortunately, I didn't record it while it was going on, but you could just see all these different phones and devices all plugged in. I, I just love this type of craziness here. So this was really fun to check out. And of course, there's a Lisa hiding in the background. Why not? Let's check out one of the smaller rooms. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to visit this too often because we had to monitor our own booths, but this was that area that was set up with those video game development systems before, and you had just totally awesome exhibits from wall to wall. I mean, it's amazing to me that they have the electricity to power all of these systems at once. But anyway, there was just a lot of cool stuff here to check out, and I'm sorry that I wasn't able to personally look at every single one of these and poke around with them. There just never seems to be enough time, but it was really cool just looking around and seeing some machines like this TRS-80 fully decked out and up and running. And of course, what's a trip to a VCF event without supporting them and buying some merchandise? I feel like it's my duty to promote and support this show because they were very kind in asking us to come and set up our tables at no charge to us. So it was the least I could do to come here and buy some t-shirts, buy some mouse pads, buy a hat, and support them in any way I could. Again, check out vcfed.org for all the information about this wonderful organization. But these events aren't just about buying things. They're about talking to people, meeting people, and helping out each other. My new friend Elliot here, who I actually met at VCF last year, was looking for a new hard drive for his Power Mac G3 all-in-one. Unfortunately, it had died. Well, I just happened to have a spare SCSI drive with me, so I formatted it, put a copy of Mac OS on there, and handed it off to him. It's just so awesome to make these connections and friends and help each other out. That's a staple of the vintage computer community. And it was time to make one last trip to the consignment area, rummage through that free pile, and just see what was lying around. Although a lot of the items did sell, there were still quite a few things to look through. And some of the prices have gone down. Some things were still around, like this Power Mac G4 Quicksilver model, which had a lot of cosmetic modifications, which maybe people didn't want because of that reason, but it did have a lower price, and there were a lot of upgrades done to this machine. So there were still some cool things to pick up and bargains to be had, even on Sunday evening. Oh, and let's not forget about that buried Mac. Here's the moment of truth. And of course, it's no surprise it works. I mean, it's a Mac SE. You can't kill it. Oh, and don't forget, if you haven't seen it already, go check out Sean's video about his cursed Capro. So that's what I experienced at VCF East 2022. Again, a huge shout out and kudos goes to the whole VCF team who set up and managed this excellent event. Everybody at this event was so kind and so friendly, so thank you. For more details about VCF and their future events, check out vcfed.org. There may be an event coming to a location near you. I also want to give a huge thanks to everyone who came to visit our booths, said hello, exchanged stickers or little gadgets and things like that. It was so nice to meet everybody in person, recognize a name and put it to a face and just say hello, take your photo with a quick take and print out a picture and fun stuff like that. We had a blast. It was an amazing time as always, and I can't wait to do it again. And big thanks to my friends Mike and Sean for hanging out with me the whole two days at the event. That was a lot of fun. And everybody I met said hello to online or in person. Thank you for stopping by the booth. But that's about it for now. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Mac84TV. And you can also support me on Patreon.com forward slash Mac84. That's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you right here next time on Mac84.